Standard economics books talk about how money evolved out of a barter. Your research and that of others offers a radically different perspective on its origins. Yeah, that's right. I came to economics maybe 10 years after an undergraduate degree. And so when I started reading the textbooks and they have the Paul Samuelson story that you've got Robinson Crusoe and Friday and they're bartering and then they discover that that's pretty inconvenient. So they choose some handy um, commodity to serve as a medium of exchange, maybe a seashell or something like that. And then gradually there's supposed to be this evolution to gold and then finally to coining gold, and then eventually we end up with banks, and finally the government comes along with fiat money. So that's the story. I knew that couldn't possibly be right. It's the the story of a Robinson Crusoe and Friday who are independent producers. You know, that just doesn't fit anything we know about the evolution of human societies. So I knew it had to be wrong from the very beginning. So what was the process then? How did currencies evolve? Well, we'll never know the absolute truth about that. And there are two reasons. One is that the earliest writing we find, it already is recording money values, credits and debits. In fact, there's a hypothesis that writing was invented to keep track of these credits and debits. So in other words, we're not going to find someone sitting down and saying well and writing down hey i invented money today this is how i did it we'll never find it because money probably predates writing the other problem is that it's not so clear what money is money's not a thing it's not something you'll ever dig out of the ground it's a very complicated institutional arrangement it's social by nature and so we've got to you know, understand the society we're looking at and identify something in that society that we might want to identify as this institution we call money. The farther we go back in time, the less those societies are like ours. And so it's much harder to identify something in those early societies that is an institutionalized arrangement that is something like the institution we use today that we call money. It's not even that clear what money is in our society today. We, we have major disagreements about what money is, even if we're talking about 2012 United States. Some people are of the opinion that money originated out of the state. Is this essentially your position? I think it's the most plausible scenario. Now, again, this gets back to what do we want to call money? The traditional economic answer to that has been to identify money with what money does. That is a function of money. And if we look at our modern societies, one of the obvious things money does is it serves as a medium of exchange. I go to the store, I don't have to take a bag of coconuts, I take a pocket full of coins and I buy what I want to buy. I think that's a pretty superficial way to go about it. I would approach it the same way that John Maynard Keynes did, and that is to identify money as a measuring unit. It's a unit of account, a money of account. So when we want to measure economic values in the United States, you can ask someone, uh, you know, what's the value of that? The answer almost always is going to be in dollar terms. So we want to start from the view that money is a unit of account. It's a measuring unit. And of course, we've got many other measuring units. These measuring units have to be social. We, we couldn't get along if you used your own idiosyncratic uh, measuring unit. These things are always socially adopted. We know that things like the foot came from measuring units that were adopted by the leadership, supposedly the length of the leader's foot or the distance from the uh, elbow to the tip of the finger and so on. And these are socially established. So it's very likely that the money unit also was socially established. And let me just say, the money unit is much more complicated than these other measuring units. It's fairly easy to measure length, width, weight. But when you're comparing things that have really nothing in common, very heterogeneous types of things that we're going to try to measure in a money unit, conceptually, that's a, a huge leap for humans to make.
it's not an obvious thing to do. It probably came out of some kind of an authority, but there probably is a social institution already in existence that gets modified to measure what we now know as money values. I don't think there's necessarily one particular historical path that led to this idea that you can measure things in money units, but the most plausible one is the story of Vergeld. It was very common all over the world in tribal society to have a system of debts based on transgressions and injuries caused by individuals. In order to prevent blood feuds from developing, they would come up with payments to be made to the victims. So if I lose my ear in a fight, they owe me so much corn or something like this. Yes. If a member of another family does you harm, the tribe has come up with a list of the penalties that had to be paid to the victims depending on the severity of the crime. These had to be socially established, socially agreed upon, and then remembered because, again, this is before writing. This part is not speculation. We know that this existed. Now we move on to a bit more speculative. When we move from an egalitarian tribal society towards societies that have authorities and inequality, it's likely that these authorities would start taking part of that penalty payment. And this is probably where fines come from. Over time, the authorities probably took a larger and larger part until we finally get to the victims don't get anything. So most likely the evolution happened this way. So there could have been some sort of a efficiency enhancing evolution in which it made sense to try to reduce the penalty assessed to a few items that actually would be useful to the authorities. Gradually to start to measure the penalty in a uniform unit of account. And then eventually the authority could set prices in terms of that unit of account on every possible thing the authorities might want. Then it becomes a matter of the authorities can receive in payment some representation of this value and use that to purchase what it wants. This is where the notion of something like a central authority, probably in the beginning temples, then palaces, and then states. And so this, this unit of account, was it typically a commodity? What we know is that all the early money units names were names for grains by weight unit. And this makes sense where the, the grain was the most important food stuff by far. And how did it make the jump from, say, a commodity backed currency to a purely fiat or paper currency? You see, I wouldn't say that these are commodity backed in any in any way. The money unit measured in terms of grain isn't necessarily a grain backed money unit. It can have a life completely separate from the grain. It's just that there are a certain number of grains in a, a bushel of wheat, and we use that to be our dollar or our pound. In the beginning, the, these things can be fiat, money. They're measured in a money unit. But in Mesopotamia, we can just mark it up on a clay tablet. So we're keeping track of what you owe me and what I owe you in terms of the barley grain unit written on a piece of clay. It's not backing the currency. It's just the unit of measurement for a transaction. Right. Like the, the modern pound or the old Italian lira, obviously these have to do with weight units. But there is nothing backing them up. Let's talk about uh, GF Knapp and chartalism. Moving this to around the turn of the 20th century, Knapp came out of the German historical school and he posited that all monies are state monies. What he meant was that the state chooses the money of account 
it imposes liabilities to the state in that money of account. Until the mid 19th century, most of the liabilities to the state actually were fees and fines. But by the 20th century, the main liability to the state is taxes. What we have done following NAB is call it a taxes drive money view. The state issues a liability denominated in its own money of account to buy what it wants. So, for example, in America, the government basically issues debt and buys stuff with that debt and people accept that government debt. Because they have a liability to the state. So that's why we call it taxes drive money. We always ask, you know, from inception, the creation of a new state, uh, let's say the United States, the state can adopt the unit of account and say dollar. Okay, we want everything denominated in dollars. The only thing we're going to enforce in U.S. courts is a dollar liability or credit. Now the state wants to move resources to the public purpose. How is it going to do that? Well, it can issue liabilities denominated in the dollar, and these liabilities can be pieces of paper, uh, today Federal Reserve notes. It can be shiny metal coins, or it could be just numbers on uh, computer tapes that indicate you've got a deposit in your bank. It doesn't really matter that much what this IOU is printed on, but the state is issuing the IOU. The question is, why would you accept that? The state doesn't promise to convert it to anything. Uh, it has no inherent value. It's a piece of paper or it's shiny metal, but it's base metal, not gold. Why would you accept it? The answer is because you owe the state. You owe the state taxes, fees, fines. From inception, the state has to first impose a liability before it will find anyone willing to accept its own IOUs. So from inception, it is the tax liability that drives the demand for the, the government's um, IOUs that we normally call currency. So, for example, if you ran a shop and a government official came in and wanted to buy all your stock for dollars, and if you didn't have to pay any taxes, why would you accept them? That's right. Now, some people then, but hold on a second. Most of the time, when I accept dollars, I'm not even thinking about the tax liability. What I'm thinking about is I'm going to go to the store and buy something. And of course, that's true. Once you've got the tax system in place and you have created this huge demand for dollars, most of the time when you're accepting dollars, you aren't thinking about that tax liability. But what we're arguing is, what if the government made tax payment completely voluntary or maybe just got rid of the tax liabilities altogether? What would happen to the value of the dollar? Our argument is eventually, and this could take a lot, a long time because we have a long history of using the dollar, but eventually the demand for the dollars will go down. I read somewhere, perhaps in, in your 1998 book, Understanding Modern Money, an example of some tribe, I think in, in Africa, under British rule, and the British wanted to get the indigenous population to work for them for money. And they wouldn't. They were like, why should I go and work 12 hours to receive this piece of paper? And it wasn't until they, they actually made them pay taxes in that currency that they actually got these guys to go to work. There are lots of historical examples of this. And it's sort of funny. The Europeans would go to the colonies and, and they thought people were lazy. Say, here, we're, we're offering pounds and we can't get anyone to work. Of course, the answer was not that they were lazy. It was that they couldn't see the point. Why would I work hard for this piece of paper with the Queen's picture on it? So then they hit on the idea of, oh, we have to put a hut tax on that. Every hut owes us this many pounds. And that then drove a demand for the currency. I, I like the example of the German colony in the Yap Islands even better. In the, the Yap Islands, they already had what are, are called primitive valuables. That is these huge rocks that were of great ceremonial value. The Yap Island itself didn't have any of these big rocks. They had to take canoes across the ocean to another place, 
get these huge rocks and carve them into stone wheels with a hole in the center. The hole in the center was so that they could insert a log and several men could carry these things. Some anthropologists have argued that these things were money, and it's one of the examples economists use. Supposedly, these huge stone wheels facilitated exchange. It was more convenient than barter. You, you couldn't come up with a sillier argument than that. Okay, so the, the Germans are there, and they wanted to build a road. And like the, the British in Africa, you know, they thought, boy, these people are lazy. We can't motivate them to do it. And then the governor had the bright idea of, well, they seem to really value these rocks. And so what he did is he just had uh, his soldiers put a black X on a bunch of them and said, these are mine now. The ones with black X's I own. If you want to get them back, you have to work. And so he got them to work in order to get back their um, stone wheels. Effectively, it was a tax. And if you want to get them back, you have to do the labor for us. Can you talk about how government debt and taxation are combined today in our modern system as a thermostat for controlling the speed or temperature of the economy? Before we get there, people need to understand what is the purpose of the tax. So I just want to repeat this. When the British went to Africa, they didn't need to get pounds from the Africans. They didn't need pounds. All the pounds in Africa came from Britain. The, the Africans didn't use pounds. They didn't print pounds. Every pound that an African had came from Britain. So the colonial governor in Africa did not need the pounds. He needed the labor. He wanted the roads built. Okay. So the purpose of the tax was to move resources, that is labor, to the colonial governor. It was not to get pound revenue. And that is still true today in the UK and in the United States. Our governments do not need dollars or pounds. All the dollars and pounds that they receive came from the government. The purpose of the tax is to drive a demand for the government's own currency. The government doesn't need its own currency. It issues the currency. It can never run out. Now, in the old days, when you actually use gold in coins, you could argue that you could run out of the gold. You might have to reduce the amount of gold in every coin and so on. So that, that's a, a whole other story. But clearly, we don't do that anymore. And in fact, most government payments are purely electronic. The Mesopotamians understood this. The British crowns mostly use tally sticks in their purchases. This is a, a whole history that's been forgotten. Until the 1840s, the British government bought things with sticks. A tally stick was uh, made of hazel wood. It had notches in it to indicate so many pounds. It was split down the middle to get stock and stub. We still use these terms. The reason for the, the splitting was to avoid any counterfeiting. So the, the king would purchase, say, materials for war by issuing a tally stick. It was called raising a tally. The uh, sellers to the government would keep their half of the stick, and then these were used to pay taxes later. So when the exchequer went out and spread the blanket on the, the ground in every village and collected taxes, most of the revenue that he received was those tally sticks. He then had to match them with the half of the stick that was retained by the crown to make sure they hadn't been counterfeited. And this is what tax revenue was. There, there's just no possibility that the exchequer didn't understand how this works. It's always been known that this is the way the government spends on taxes. The gold standard actually w was a very, very short historical period. If we talk about the classical gold standard working sort of the way that economists think that it worked, it was from about 1880 until the Great Depression. And we were off it during World War I. Historically, it's insignificant. If we define it m more broadly, where there um, was some gold backing to the, the currency, on and off, we had it for about 200 years. Every time there's a crisis, the country goes off gold. So going off gold in the 30s was not unusual. It was absolutely to be expected. Anytime there's a financial crisis, they go off gold. And the reason is because they know there's going to be a run to gold. And if the treasury runs out of gold, first, you can't make any international payments. Second, of course, you start worrying about the convertibility. So they always go off gold in crises. 
how does the current US government manage its currency with respect to central bank and the government debt? Well, in the United States, we created the, the Fed in 1913, and part of the Federal Reserve Act mandated that we separate treasury functions from central bank functions. Most developed countries today do that. They are both branches of government. There is a little bit of independence, and this little bit of independence leads to lots of confusion, unfortunately. If we go back to 1913, Congress thought that by separating Treasury and Fed and mandating that the Treasury had to write checks on its deposit at the Fed, it was somehow going to prevent the Treasury from, in quote marks, printing money in order to finance its spending. This is probably in large part because they believed that too much money causes inflation, which of course became the, the monetarist mantra. And also that if you didn't constrain the government, it would spend too much. And today, a lot of people think that that restriction requiring your treasury to have money in its account at its central bank before it spends constrains the spending. Now, in reality, it doesn't. And the reason is because the central bank and the treasury always develop procedures to ensure that the treasury has money in its account whenever it needs to spend. The other prohibition that we put to make it more difficult for them to coordinate their um, activities was to prohibit the central bank from buying treasury debt directly. Because if the treasury can just issue a bond and sell it to the Fed, then it immediately gets an account at the Fed that it can spend. And so that would get easily get around this prohibition on just printing money to finance spending because the Fed would be crediting the Treasury's account and they can immediately write checks. But the reality is it makes no difference. And the reason is because the Treasury just sells bonds to banks and the Fed credits the bank's reserves to allow the bank to buy the bonds. The private bank credits the Treasury's account at the private bank. These are called tax and loan accounts in the U.S. And then the Treasury moves its deposit to the Fed out of the private bank, and then it writes a check. So in practice, these operational constraints on the Treasury do not prevent it from spending at all. There's just one final thing that we've done in the United States, which I think almost everybody agrees is fairly crazy, which is that we have a debt limit. Most countries don't have this. But in the United States, the Treasury is permitted to issue only a certain number of bonds. And once it reaches that limit, it has to go to Congress and have Congress raise the debt limit. And so this could serve as a barrier because once the Treasury has sold as many bonds as it's permitted, according to the debt limit, to private banks, it can't sell more. This allows Congress to have these public debates about profligate government spending and all of that. And the expectation is that they will raise the debt limit after they argue about it for a while. This actually could constrain the government if they ever didn't raise the debt limit. So the way that government issues debt now is with a treasury bond. And in effect, the rigmarole that surrounds the central bank in America and the primary bank dealers in America buying treasury bonds and crediting the treasury's account at the Fed, it essentially works as a way to allow the treasury to basically pump money into the economy that when it needs it. Well, yes. If you sell either labor or something you produced to the government, you end up with a deposit at your bank. So in that sense, government spending always increases the money supply measured as deposits at banks. So that is true. Your bank will also get a credit to its reserve account at the central bank. There always are two simultaneous credits made when the government spends. One is to your deposit account and one is to your bank's reserves at the central bank, which is the bank's deposit account. Now, when you pay taxes, the whole thing is just reversed. Your deposit at your bank goes down and your bank's deposit at the central bank goes down. Okay, so we can think of these as credits when the government spends, debits when the government taxes. 
Now, when the government spends more than it taxes, it is net crediting because its credits are greater than the debits. Normally, banks don't want to hold more reserves at the central bank. The reason is because they pay very little interest. So these are an asset of your bank, but they are a low earning asset. They would much rather have a government bond. We can think of a bank deposit at the central bank as a checking account. We can think of a treasury bond as a saving account. So effectively, what banks do is they move their deposits from their checking account at the Fed to their savings account at the Fed, which we call a treasury. And really, it is the Fed that keeps track of these things. So all that a bond sale really is, is a transfer from a checking account to a savings account. And how does this link with the interest rate that's set by the central bank? Well, the, the central bank sets the overnight rate. I think you guys call it a bank rate. We call it the Fed funds rate. That is the target interest rate. And this is the base interest rate because it is effectively overnight lending from the central bank to banks and from banks to one another. So it's a very short term and very risk free borrowing rate. This is absolutely set by the central bank. When you move on to treasury bills and bonds, they have different maturities. And for banks, the shortest term treasury bill is going to be an extremely close substitute to overnight lending to other banks. The reason is because they're both risk free. They're both very short term. So say a 30 day treasury bill will have an interest rate that is within a couple basis points of the Fed funds rate. Because from a bank's point of view, they could either hold a bill or they can lend funds in the Fed funds market to other banks. Okay, and that's the interest rate they're going to get. When you move out the maturity structure to longer term bonds, they aren't quite perfect substitutes. People who know economics and finance know that the longer the maturity, the greater the chance there is of a capital loss. Because if interest rates go up, the price of a bond goes down. That doesn't really affect a 30-day bill, but when we get out to a 10-year bond, the capital losses can be fairly big if interest rates should rise. So now the determination of the interest rate will usually be more complex. It's going to depend on where do you think interest rates are going to go. If you think the central bank is going to start tightening and raising the overnight interest rate, then that would lead to capital losses. So the only way that you would buy a 10-year bond rather than a 30-day bill is if the interest rate is higher. So the normal term structure is for the interest rate to be higher on longer-term bonds. And it's going to depend a, a bit on what you believe policy is going to be, as is the case in the United States right now. The Fed has signaled very clearly to markets they're going to keep interest rates near zero for a very long time. Then the risk of capital loss is very small. So the long-term rate can decline down to probably around two percentage points versus nearly zero on overnight lending. The final point is, what if the central bank decided 2% is too high on long-term bonds? We really would like it lower than that. The central bank can just stand there and say, look, we will buy 10-year up to 30-year treasuries at a price that would give an equivalent interest rate of 1%. Could they do it? The answer is, of course they can, because they buy treasuries through keystrokes. Even Bernanke testified uh, in Congress and also said it in, a, in an interview on TV when he was asked, where do you get all the money for all of this quantitative easing purchases? of bonds, he said, keystrokes. We can't run out of keystrokes. We can buy as much as we want. So the central bank always has the option of completely controlling the market in every treasury security and even mortgage-backed securities if it wanted to by saying we will buy as much as it takes to get the interest rate down to 1%. So the central bank actually can set the interest rate on every maturity of treasuries if it wants to. Normally, they don't do that. But in World War II, the Fed set the interest rate on the whole maturity range of all treasuries. And even though the budget deficit was 25% of GDP, 
we had the government issuing bonds at three-eighths of one percent. And that was because that is what the Fed wanted. In your book, back in 1998, you laid out a lot of the structural and design flaws in the euro. Most of the things you talked about have come to pass. Can you explain the differences to the layman in why rates in countries such as the US, the UK and Japan are so low, but in Europe, things are going in exactly the opposite direction? If you think of European states, they became like US states. So Germany is, let's say, New Jersey. Greece is Mississippi. They each gave up their own currency and joined a currency union. In Europe's case, they joined the euro. In the United States case, they're all members of the dollar union. If we look at U.S. states, none of them is allowed to run a budget deficit. Now, that, that doesn't mean they always, at the end of the year, end up with a balanced budget. Uh, they don't, especially in a recession. They are prohibited by the constitutions and they are punished by markets as soon as they run a budget deficit of any size at all. The market punishes them by downgrading them. The reason is because they can become insolvent, they can default on the debt. U.S. states and U.S. local governments can and do default on their debts. They are not sovereign in that sense. They don't issue their own currency. They cannot spend just by keystrokes. Now, if we move over to Europe, when each nation gave up their currency, they became like a U.S. state. They adopted effectively a foreign currency called the euro. But the Maastricht criteria said you guys can run a budget deficit of 3%. It said you can run up debt equal to 60% of your GDP. In the United States, no U.S. state ever had debt, anything like that. The typical case is 10 to 15%. And the reason is because of solvency risk. You're afraid they're going to default on the debt. So from the very beginning, the criteria in Europe were not consistent with a non-sovereign state's status. So we knew that there was going to be a problem. And in fact, we know, of course, most of the nations, most of the time exceeded even the Maastricht criteria. So they had budget deficits bigger than 3%, and eventually they got debt ratios much over 60%. Of course, some states like Italy entered with a debt ratio already far greater than 60%. So the only question was, when will markets figure out that Greece is Mississippi? It's not a sovereign nation anymore. Germany is New Jersey. It's not a sovereign state anymore. Everyone thinks Germany is really strong, but if you look at its deficit and debt ratios, it's worse than the worst normal U.S. states. Right now, in this crisis, uh, we've got some states like California that have huge budget deficits, and they're, they're facing the same kinds of problems that Greece is facing. Here's the difference, though. In the United States, we've got Uncle Sam. When things go really bad, Uncle Sam is there. If a hurricane hits New Orleans, we get massive fiscal response from Washington. They spend a lot of money in New Orleans. When a financial crisis hits, a lot of our banks are headquartered in just a few states. We don't expect, say, North Carolina to be responsible for huge banks that happen to be headquartered in North Carolina. They are bailed out by Uncle Sam. But when the crisis hit Euroland, we told every individual state, you're responsible for any banks that are headquartered in your state. So Ireland blew up their budget, bailing out banks that had debts all over Europe. The Irish bailout of banks was the greatest act of charity in the history of the whole world. They were saving French and German banks. The Irish government had no debt until the crisis. I don't think it was an act of charity. You could also say stupid. Or coerced as well. Well, all right. We would never expect the U.S. state to do something like this. You know, it's crazy. But it, it had to be done this way because you had no equivalent of Washington to come to the rescue. We, we were always watching the interest rate spreads. That is the difference between, say, German government debt interest rates and Spanish government debt interest rates. The hypothesis was, by the mainstream, by the promoters of the EMU, that once you unified Europe, the interest rates would all converge toward German rates, which were the lowest. So that was their expectation. And it did happen in the beginning. 
our expectation was as soon as markets realize what they're dealing with, the interest rates will diverge because they will recognize that Germany is very different from Greece. And of course, that is eventually what happened. And that's what killed the peripheral nations. Their interest rates just exploded. As soon as markets started to realize, hey, there's no Uncle Sam here. There's no one that's going to come to their rescue. So the, the, the only reason why interest rates could converge was either because markets didn't understand the situation or they thought, well, if there are any problems, the ECB will come to the rescue. We now know that that second hypothesis was somewhat true. The ECB has done lots of things that definitely were against the spirit of Maastricht and probably against the law. The ECB has done something, but it's always too little, it's always too late, and it's always with strings attached. The main string is you have to adopt austerity. And adopting austerity when you're in a crisis and a downturn only makes things worse. And that's why, even though it does look like the ECB probably will continue to intervene, it's going to prevent a complete meltdown, there still is great risk in buying the debt of any country except Germany. In the UK and Japan and America, we see record low rates and they're in massive deficit. To explain to the layman is that when a government that has control over their own currency issues the debt, that that money then gets spent by the government into the economy and ends up in the banks as extra reserves. And then what are the banks going to do with these extra reserves only buy government bonds and thus drive the interest rate down lower? It will drive interest rates down to the central bank's target interest rate. Target interest rate. Yes. So... This mechanism explains why Japan for 20 years has had very, very low interest rates and a massive government debt as a percentage of GDP. But in the euro, where the governments can't issue their own currency, that there is actually a default risk like there is at the state of Mississippi and then interest rates spread massively. Yeah, that's right. It's the difference between a sovereign and a non-sovereign issuer. The sovereign issuer of its own currency can have any interest rate at once. In the United States, the, the Fed could possibly decide it wants an interest rate of 10%. If it chose that, then we would have an interest rate of 10%. The point is, it's not market determined. Under Bill Clinton, the government ran a surplus for a while. At this time, the banks expanded the credit money supply while the government was reducing the government debt. So things didn't look so bad. How did this affect the politics of then and now? The, the Clinton administration and Democrats uh, more generally learned the wrong lesson, unfortunately. We said that the Clinton budget surpluses would destroy the Goldilocks economy. We would go into a recession. The budget deficits would return. We were going to have a downturn because the private sector was becoming too heavily indebted. It would cut its spending and try to repay the debt, and we would probably have a financial crisis. Well, eventually, all those things came to happen. It took longer than we expected. The expansion went on longer than we expected because the private sector spent more than its income for a whole decade. It wasn't until the private sector realized how much debt it was in that it started to cut back spending and then the economy collapsed. And finally, the private sector started spending less than its income and it continues to today. Our view always was that the, the budget surplus was a mistake and would end the expansion. What most people don't recognize, and I always think of this Wall Street Journal article, I think it was in 1998, front page. It had two stories. On the left-hand side, uh, it said, finally, the government is adding to national savings by running a budget surplus for the first time since 1929. Note the date. And then on the right-hand side, it said, oh, it's terrible. The private sector is dissaving, spending more than its income. Two stories, one about the government adding to saving by running a surplus, the other about the private sector reducing national saving by running a deficit. But actually, the two things have to be linked because for every sector of the economy that spends less than its income, another sector of the economy has to spend more than its income. 
because at the aggregate level, the balances have to balance. For every positive, there has to be a negative. And if we were doing visuals here, I could show you a picture and you will see an exact mirror image of the deficits always equal the surpluses for every country on earth at every point in time. So we, we knew that these two things were linked. It was only because the private sector was spending more than its income that the government sector could spend less than its income. Now, there is a third sector, that's the foreign sector. In the U.S. case, that actually makes things worse for the private sector because we always run a deficit in our foreign sector. That is, we run a current account deficit. So that made the private sector deficit even larger than the government surplus. So what policy prescriptions would you and other members of the MMT school propose for the credit crunch? Well, the only way to get out of this is fiscal policy. For the United States and UK, Japan, other sovereign nations, the economics is really simple. We know how to do this. We need the government to spend and, and possibly give tax cuts. Fiscal policy, economically, it's, it's really simple. Uh, we learned what to do in the 1930s. We just need to do it on a big scale, much bigger than the stimulus packages that we had in the past. We're probably talking about somewhere on the order of six, seven, eight percent of GDP. That's what we need. Politically difficult, I know that, because everyone wants to balance the budget. Why do you think these obvious learnings from the past are not being used now? I don't really want to talk about politics in the UK because I don't know anything about them. I can tell you what's going on in the US. The Republicans have decided that recovery is not a winner for them. They have no interest in seeing the economy improve under President Obama. So I think they made a decision very early on that they were going to obstruct any attempt to use fiscal stimulus to get, get us out of the recession because they prefer recession. If they win the election and they maintain seats in Congress, it's possible they might change. I don't, don't really know. Democrats, unfortunately, as I already said, learned the wrong lesson from President Clinton. And so I think a lot of Democrats, including probably President Obama, really believe the story that the Clinton years were so good because we ran a budget surplus. Actually, the reverse is the case. It's because economic growth was pretty good that tax revenue really exploded and got us a budget surplus that then killed the economy. But that's not the story they tell. It, it's sort of inevitable that when you have a very long period without a Great Depression, which we did from the 1930s until now, the memories of the Great Depression fade. This is what my professor, Hyman Minsky, used to always say. The farther you get away from the Great Depression, the more the memory fades. And you start to think that a Great Depression and even a financial crisis, a severe one, isn't even possible. Well, we now know it is possible. It did happen again. And a Great Depression is, I would say, unlikely. But recovery is not going to get underway without some fiscal stimulus. So I think that that's part of the problem. I saw that you did some work on uh, speculation in the commodity markets, in particular into oil. What part of these amazing price spikes that we see in these commodities do you think are related to speculation on, on what to effects such as peak oil or, or limits to growth that are driving these bubbles? The study you refer to covered the period through 2008, and I'm pretty confident talking about the period up to 2008. There, it's very clear what happened. The United States in 1999, we essentially freed pension funds to invest in, almost, in virtually anything they want to invest in. They were able to go into commodities. And in fact, more than that, the new legislation pretty much mandated that they do it. They had to diversify their portfolios into something not correlated with stock markets. And up through 2000, commodities markets were not correlated with stock markets. So the idea was if the stock market crashes, at least you've got a lot of investments in commodities. They're not likely to move with stock markets. We now know better. When you get into a financial crisis, suddenly everything is correlated together. 
because everybody is selling out of everything they can get out of in order to cover their own debts. In the beginning, they actually were buying physical commodities and storing them, not just a hedge against the stock market crash, as an earning asset. As long as commodity prices go up, the stuff you've got stored is going up in value, and you get to book a return on that. Now, the problem is that storing commodities is expensive. And it became more expensive because all the storage facilities got filled up and the rent started going up. By about 2004, the storage costs had hit an all-time peak. There were stories about oil tankers. They were just driving around the world. I mean, literally driving around the world to keep oil out of the market. It was being stored, waiting for the price to go up. But as storage costs went up, the pension funds started moving into the futures markets. So here, you're rather than storing commodities, you're buying a piece of paper that entitles you to have commodities delivered one, two, three, or four months into the future. You never actually have to take delivery. You just roll over the contract into a new futures contract for another period of one to four months. And it turns out that what's called the spot price, that is the price you actually pay for a commodity today, is mostly determined by these futures prices. So as pension money flowed into the futures markets, they started driving up the futures prices. You could always roll these over and make money on the deal because from the time you bought the contract until you roll it over, the price of the contracts has gone up. So you can find a buyer at a higher price than you had paid for it. As long as everyone is moving in to these futures contracts, making one-way bets that the price will go up, and the money keeps going in, the price will always go up. That's what happened from 2004 to 2008. And because commodities prices are actually determined in reference to these futures contract prices, commodities prices went up. We had the biggest commodities price boom in human history from 2004 to 2008. It wasn't just oil, it wasn't just soybean and corn. You go across 25 commodities, all of their prices went up by historic amounts. Everyone knows about the tulip bulb mania. That was nothing compared to this because here we had 25 commodities all experiencing the greatest increase in price they had ever experienced. What happened in 2008? You remember that oil prices were about $150 a barrel suddenly they went to 49. What happened? Pension funds got scared. Congress started an investigation. They brought in representatives of oil and so on, and they also brought in people like Michael Greenberger, who'd been studying this, and Mike Masters. They're the, the two most important people for uncovering the story about the pension funds. The pension funds were worried about two things. One, we're going to get legislation against pension funds buying futures contracts and commodities. And second, there's going to be a horrendous amount of bad publicity about pensions driving up prices at the gas pump. So they decided to pull out. At the end of summer 2008 and in the early fall, they pulled one third of their money out of the futures contracts and prices just collapsed. So it was very clear the correlation is just uncanny. You can plot the flows of pension fund money going in, driving up prices, pension fund money pulled out, and prices collapsed. Through 2008, I'm confident this is the story. After that, I think it's still speculation, and the price bubble actually is increased even more than it did between 2004 and 2008, but I'm just not closely studying this so that I can say that it is pension funds again, but clearly it's speculation. So as a member of m and school or the post-Keynesian economists, how does it feel like to pretty much get all of the major economic projections correct over the last few years? I guess it's pretty good. And we, we sure get a lot of requests for interviews and appearances and making keynote talks and so on, which for a very long time we did not get. And what would it take for people like yourselves to actually get into positions of policymaking power? Regime change. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there was some hope with the Obama administration if events had turned out differently. It, it, there might have even been some possibility Unfortunately, when Obama came in in the middle of a crisis, 
And in a crisis, you're very risk averse. And I think he looked back and grabbed Clinton people, which was a huge mistake because they didn't understand the the dynamics of even the Clinton years, much less what to do in a crisis. It's very, very difficult now to see anyone with modern money theory leanings getting into positions, at least in America. So would you like to tell us about your new book that's coming out in September? About a year ago, I started writing what was called a primer on our blog site, New Economic Perspectives. Every Monday, I would post about a thousand words, building up toward an understanding of this approach to money that we've been talking about, which used to be called Chartalist, and now it's called Modern Money Theory trying to explain it to an educated but not academic or economics trained population. Took all of this, reorganized, edited, massaged it, clarified it into a book manuscript that will come out in, I believe, September by Paul Grave, Macmillan. I think that anyone who wants to try to get an understanding of what we've been talking about really, this would be the the place to start. And then if they're interested, they can read the more academic stuff. Thanks very much for coming on the show today, Professor Ray. Oh, thank you for having me.